good morning on behalf of amal jodi college of engineering it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the second phase of sttp on paradigm shift in assessment and evaluation practices for engineering graduates today i am pleased to welcome professor a sukesh who is an expert in the field of computational electromagnetics he is a coordinator of center of excellence in systems en energy and environmental Gov government engineering college kannur he is also the associate editor of shastra keralam a popular science magazine in malayalam of kerala shastra sahitya parishad his research interests include computational electromagnetics energy engineering focusing on renewable energy technology he has submitted thesis for his phd on high voltage engineering from iic bangalore and today he'll be sharing with us his expert opinion on reengineering engineering education thank you over to you sir thanks a lot uh, let me uh, first uh, thank the coordinators for uh, giving me this opportunity i am indeed uh, honored to be a part of this program uh, i was asked to speak on uh, engineering i mean reengineering engineering education okay so i'll just uh, start the screen uh, i'll just share my screen okay yeah hope my screen is visible yes sir yeah Uh, just one query ma'am uh, is the participants all from kerala or is there anyone from outside kerala we have participants from outside kerala also sir okay fine so i'll uh, stick on to english i'll uh, try to avoid malayalam as far as possible okay yes sir so uh, welcome to this talk this is actually um, uh, uh, we are facing a very particular uh, situation now Uh, due to the uh, pandemic and all uh, it is uh, impossible to uh, connect in person so uh, this online mode of uh, talk on reengineering the engineering education uh, is a shift actually from the normal mode to a different mode Uh, i guess we'll have to be used to it because uh, the whole uh, idea of this talk or the whole um, um, theme of this talk will be focusing towards uh, using uh, uh, technology for uh, engineering education okay so in this talk i would uh, like to uh, first in uh, talk about the industry because uh, engineering uh, education specifically is actually meant to uh, cater to the industry so i'll just focus my initial uh, now a uh, couple of slides on uh, industry uh, specifically the industrial revolution and i'll also talk on education uh, where uh, educational uh, field has also seen a lot of revolutions and we'll see how uh, education Uh, revolution has happened in various uh, facets then i'll talk on technical education and uh, see whether it matches uh, the industry and the education sector uh, as such and then we'll look at the interactions between uh, the three that is the industry uh, industrial scenario educational scenario technical sen education scenario uh, how uh, they are whether they are diverging or whether they are converging to a particular point and so on then we'll briefly look at uh, what would be tomorrow's world like like uh, how, what should you expect from uh, your students as and when uh, uh, time progresses tomorrow's jobs tomorrow's skills tomorrow's students and tomorrow's teachers then we'll talk on tomorrow's classroom how it should be uh, how we, it is now and how we should transform uh, the whole classroom to uh, cater to these uh, new challenges uh, 
And then we'll uh, come to the point that is re-engineering engineering education. So uh, I'll be focusing on the need for re-engineering rather than uh, uh, re-engineering as such. Okay. So if at all you have any questions in between, I don't mind if you um, unmute and ask, or you can also put it in the chat window. Maybe probably we can answer uh, it in the end. So it depends on how, uh, how comfortable you are uh, with uh, the way in which you want to ask questions. Okay, so anyway, questions are uh, welcome and I would appreciate if uh, you are frank in asking questions. Since uh, all of us are teachers, uh, I think I can be a little bit frank here uh, uh, talking about uh, teaching and uh, other skills. Okay, so we'll start with the first uh, set of slides. Here uh, you can see that uh, technical education uh, it is, yeah, technical education is meant for the industry. It was actually propelled by the industry and it was meant to cater to the needs of the industry. So uh, industry is a prime uh, factor when we deal with uh, technical education. So I'll just simply uh, take you to, through a, a brief history of industrial revolution, a brief history, okay? Now, we are standing in a particular um, uh, scenario where we are facing industrial revolution 4.0. Industrial revolution 4.0, it obviously means that um, uh, three other industrial revolutions has been uh, has already been over. Okay, so uh, industrial revolution actually started with the invention of steam engine, uh, which was long back in about 1712 or so. And uh, industrial revolution 1.0, that is what we normally teach in textbooks as industrial revolution, uh, it came into its uh, full-fledged uh, swing uh, in uh, 1784. Okay, it was the result of mechanization, steam power, weaving looms, etc. And then came uh, Industrial Revolution 2.0, where electricity uh, came into picture, the assembly line came into picture, mass production was uh, encouraged, and it took place about 1870. So we saw a, a paradigm shift there from uh, the uh, Industrial Revolution 1.0. Then uh, we came to Industrial Revolution 3.0 in about 1969 when internet compu communications, electronics, etc., cetera, uh, pitched in and um, automation uh, started in a, a very uh, meager sense. And today, uh, we are living in a world where uh, cyber physical systems, Internet of Things, uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, etc., have come into picture, and uh, we are facing that particular world today. Now, to briefly talk about the first revolution, it uh, started out about uh, 1712 when the steam engine was involved, uh, invented, and then it came to a full fledged operation in about 1760. And it was there till about 17, uh, sorry, 1840. Okay, the mechanical production, there were large factories creating lots of, uh, um, I mean, products. Uh, and then the spindle was actually the hallmark of the first uh, revolution. Uh, the spindle started uh, weaving uh, looms and looms could be sent across the globe from one place to another. And one uh, interesting fact is that it took almost 120 years for the Industrial Revolution 1.0 to spread throughout the globe. Okay, and one key uh, achievement from this Industrial Revolution was that you could make more things in an hour. You could make more products in a particular hour as and when uh, compared to the uh, era be before uh, Industrial Revolution. Okay, so this is the first Industrial Revolution that uh, took place. And 
if you look at the second rev industrial revolution, it started in uh, late 19th century and it extended to about the early 20th century. Electricity came up as a, a, a source of uh, energy and then uh, we could trans uh, transport the energy from one uh, uh, point of the globe to another point of the globe, one point where you have the energy resources to another point of globe where you want the energy resources. You don't have energy resources there, but you want energy there and you can transport it easily using electricity. So that was one triggering factor for uh, second industrial revolution. And apart from that, mass production uh, came into uh, existence by the invention of assembly line. Assembly line means it's just a, a, a set of, uh, it's a line where all the things are assembled part by part, piece by piece. For example, if you want to make a car, you don't make a car uh, at a stretch, but you make the axle first, You uh, then you join the wheels, then you join the other things and things like that. So uh, each and every part can be focused upon. So then what happened was the uh, way in which we did things. In the first industrial revolution, we were focusing on making things. Now, uh, in the second industrial revolution, we were focusing on how to make these things in a more efficient way. So there were uh, employees specialized in uh, tightening the nuts. Uh, there were employees specialized in uh, fixing the axles. There were employees specialized in tires and things like that. So uh, uh, these employees were, uh, I mean, laid down or or were aligned in a in a in a line and the product would come actually to the employee you don't need to go to the product the product will come to you so if i don't know whether you have seen this uh, uh, charlie chaplin movie which is called uh, modern times so in modern times there is a, a beautiful depiction of this uh, assembly line uh, uh, a humor humorous one too okay so uh, assembly line was actually changing uh, the, uh, the way in which we made uh, products. And one key observation from the second industrial revolution is that uh, specialization, that is you specialize on axles, you specialize on wheels, you specialize on nuts and bolts. So this specialization actually leads to an increased productivity. That is one key observation that we got from the second industrial revolution. And when the third industrial revolution came up, that is in 1960s or so, uh, when uh, computers and communications uh, started to pitch into the uh, technical scenario, we got the digital revolution. And this digital revolution, it uh, connected uh, people from all around the world. And you could in fact make a, a, a phone call, uh, which is, um, thousands of miles apart in just uh, a delay of maybe uh, a second or so. Okay, so the speed of communication was very high. Uh, the use of computers in the daily life was uh, tremendous. And in fact, if you look at this particular industrial revolution, uh, you can see that the internet, internet spread across the globe in less than 10 years. Now, if you remember the first point I was making in uh, Industrial Revolution 1.0, it took about 120 years for Industrial Revolution 1.0 to take its uh, uh, place. But in the third Industrial Revolution, this uh, duration, 120 years was just uh, reduced to a meager 10 years or so. So now uh, we are standing in the verge of this third industrial revolution and we are stepping uh, towards the fourth. So the key learnings that we have had through these industrial revolutions are that the transition time from one revolution to another is steadily decreasing. And the unit wealth which is created is having much fewer workers compared to the first and the second industrial revolutions. 
that is uh, in the first industrial revolution the factories were packed up with people lots of people doing many things and then uh, in the second re uh, industrial revolution when the uh, assembly line came up these people uh, they were uh, more structured rather than the chaos in the first industrial revolution and you can see that uh, since productivity increased you need only a smaller number of employees and unit wealth is created with much fewer workers and one more point that we can learn from here is that one revolution is a feed for the next revolution okay because industrial revolution 1.0 was the starting point for second industrial revolution the ending point of second industrial revolution was the starting for the third industrial revolution and so on and if you look at uh, closely observe the first and second industrial revolutions the second industrial revolution was actually an extension of the first industrial revolution it was uh, making use of the tools of the first uh, industrial revolution and improvising on the tools okay they didn't create anything new it was actually a continuation of the first industrial revolution but still uh, the way in which things were done changed so improvisation was done on the second industrial revolution and now when we look at the fourth industrial revolution we should uh, uh, assume or we should foresee that the fourth industrial revolution should actually build upon the third industrial revolution this is one key learning that we have from the past industrial revolutions. Now, uh, what, what is actually the fourth industrial revolution? I'll spend a little bit of time in this slide. Uh, so the fourth industrial revolution is actually having three different uh, set of revolutions. It's actually not a single revolution, it is a revolution in three different arenas. In the first uh, physical arena, autonomous vehicles started to come in. You might have heard of this Google car, uh, manless car or driverless car, uh, manless vehicles and all, okay? So uh, you don't need to have, you know, you don't need to learn driving in order to go from one place to another. That is a, a, a change that this fourth industrial revolution is bringing into you, okay? So autonomous vehicles, vehicles that propel on their own. The, if you fix a particular target and you say that uh, you want to go to this place, a uh, vehicle simply takes you there, that's it. Uh, you don't need to drive. You don't need to uh, have your, uh, I mean, uh, senses always, all the senses on the road and on the car and things like that. You're more relaxed. You, you get more relaxed. That is uh, the autonomous vehicles. So and your, the second, yeah. So yeah, your voice was breaking, sir. Oh, is it? Okay, uh, I mean, it's fine now, sir. It's fine, is it? It's okay, fine, yeah. So in the in the second one, we have this uh, physical uh, arena. We have three D printing. Three D printing has already uh, come uh, a long way. Okay. Uh, in fact, in our institute, we have a three D printer. Uh, most of the institutes now do have this fabrication labs, fab labs and things like that, uh, where 3D printing and uh, uh, 3D printing uh, can be done. So 3D printing is a key uh, uh, improvement from uh, or, or key uh, participant in the fourth industrial revolution. Then comes robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, that has also come a long way. In fact, you, you, we don't even realize that we are part of uh, artificial intelligence. For example, uh, you might have used your Gmail, is it? Uh, Gmail, when you used it, Gmail in the earlier days, you, you had to type all the uh, letters and sentences into the uh, mail. But now, if you go and type something in Gmail, you simply say, uh, I mean, say, for example, if you want to type thanks and regards, you just simply type TH uh, a, a, and then all the other letters automatically come there. Okay, that is a contribution of artificial intelligence. Uh, we don't uh, even realize that we are part of artificial intelligence, but it has already come into our life. When you start typing maybe in your mobile phone, 
uh, you just simply uh, you don't need to know the spelling and all uh, uh, in in this particular uh, uh, age you, you suppose you want to type receive you just type r e c and then uh, the whole wor word comes up uh, in your mobile screen you just need to select it okay so uh, the things that what uh, we emphasized on when we were studying actually we emphasized on studying spelling okay now we don't need to know uh, the spelling of words it's already there in that uh, in in your uh, smart device where you can touch and uh, you 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 get the uh, spelling right that's it okay so robotics is, and art artificial intelligence has uh, <clears throat> been a part of this uh, physical arena of uh, fourth industrial revolution then comes new materials new materials uh, uh, which are nanomaterials and biomaterials okay they have come up and these is going to uh, change uh, the world for you and apart from the physical side in the digital arena also we have many technologies that have come up one is the internet of things iot internet of things uh, is the, uh, simply said is that uh, instead of connecting computers in a network you connect things in a network you might have heard of smart homes and things like that so uh, you just have a remote with you uh, you go to your home you click on the remote and the door opens for you you just enter inside the uh, lights are on for you and you just come out of your uh, home the lights are, are again off for you okay so these are all connected smart devices have come up and they have been connected uh, in a network and you can control it from anywhere else also if you have uh, an application in your mobile phone uh, uh, you can uh, switch on a, a fan or a, a, a motor or whatever in your home from your office so iot has uh, come up in a uh, a big sense in digital arena and the way in which the economy works has also changed if you look at the large large companies today uber the world's largest taxi company they don't own even a single vehicle uber does not have any vehicle they just hire people uh, with vehicles and then operate uh, their company facebook is the world's most popular media owner it does not create its own content content is created by people youtube you create the videos and upload it to youtube uh, people don't uh, i mean youtube doesn't create video on its own okay so uh, these have uh, come up in a in a big way alibaba the most valuable retailer has no inventory at all airbnb it's the world's largest accommodation provider it does not even own a single lodge of its own okay so uh, things have changed economy is going uh, economy is changing and then comes the biological arena gene editing in in the in the uh, in in the biology field gene editing has uh, given rise to new uh, crops new uh, species changing the way in which uh, i mean uh, diseases can be handled okay so gene editing has come up and the most beautiful thing is 3d printing of biomaterials has already come up and if you you may you may be surprised industrial revolution 4.0 it's predicted by world economic forum that in 2025 this will already be in full fledged uh, shape 3d printing of biomaterials is interesting recently there was a uh, i mean invention by uh, some researchers where you can in fact print your liver they started with your uh, with the liver you don't if you if your liver is in a problematic condition you just go to a, a place where your liver is printed you give uh, your gene sequence there and this gene sequence is accepted by the computer it, uh, and using biomaterials it just prints your liver in a couple of hours time and you just fix it inside your body that's it 
you replace your liver. You don't need to uh, go for organ transplantations and things like that. So uh, the biological arena is also changing, especially medicine is changing. So these are the triggers for fourth industrial revolution. And what will be the key changes here? The changes would be the boundaries between humans, machines, information, communication are becoming increasingly convergent. That is, uh, right now, you can say that you are a human being. Okay, now you have your mobile phone with you, your smartphone with you. And suppose you lose your smartphone. All, all your data is probably stored in that. Okay, so you don't even know your uh, home uh, phone number. Uh, you don't even memorize it, right? Earlier, we used to memorize phone numbers. Now we don't memorize phone numbers. It's already there inside. If you ask your husband's phone number or your wife's phone number, you don't know. You'll have to look into your smartphone to see what is the phone number, okay? So uh, your smartphone is lost means your identity is lost. You can't separate yourself with your smartphone. You don't have an existence without your smart smartphone. So humans and machines and information and communication, everything is becoming increasingly convergent. And one more key change is in the meaning of literacy. What do you mean by literacy? Earlier, uh, we used to uh, say that uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if I want to call you a literate person, I need to say, uh, you need to have uh, reading skills. You need to have writing skills. You need to know mathematics. Reading, writing, mathematics was co were com considered as the primary literacy skills that a person needs to have. What about today? Today, literacy has changed from all these things to data literacy, technology literacy, and human resource literacy. Data literacy means there is floods of data in front of you. Now the point is you need to uh, identify which one is right, which one suits you best. Okay, so that is data literacy. If you don't know how to differentiate between a fake content in, in the internet and a good content in the internet, then you're, uh, you don't have that data literacy. The fact that you don't have data literacy is why uh, you always share your uh, OTP numbers and uh, mobile phone, uh, I mean, uh, passwords and all to other people for uh, creating fraud. So data literacy is an important thing in today's life. The second literacy that is technology literacy. You need to know about what uh, technology suits what particular application. For example, you're, go, uh, you're traveling in a train. Earlier, uh, when we used to travel in the train in the, in the night, suppose you want to uh, exit from the train in the night, you'll have to stay awake throughout. Now you don't need to do that. You, if you have your, uh, 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 an app technology installed, an app, ad, app application installed in your mobile phone, you just need to set a reminder that uh, when you reach the station, please in, uh, wake me up. Simple, technology literacy is to be there. And the third most important one is the human resource literacy. You need to know how uh, a human being responds to a particular scenario. You need to know how, how to deal with human beings because the way in which human beings are, uh, uh, are dealing with other people are also changing. The interactions are also changing. So these are the literacies in today's life, not reading, writing, and mathematics. Reading, writing, and mathematics are just a, a, a subset of this. But the most important literacy you need is data, technology, and human resource. These are the key changes that Industrial Revolution 4.0 is bringing for you. So with this, let's uh, take a peep at general education how education has transformed. We have seen that industry has transformed. Now we look at how education has transformed, general education, not technical education. General education was thought to be for the people, by the people, to the people. 
now since people are changing with respect to the technology uh, uh, increase in their lives education is also changing let's see how in the beginnings we were talking about education 1.0 in education 1.0 we had classrooms classrooms were authoritarian teachers were the absolute leaders in the classroom whatever the teacher dictates the student copies down the information the teacher gives is downloaded into the uh, students mind and the notebook students is just a passive recipient and technology is always forbidden in the classroom even now i think people um uh, don't allow um, mobile phones in the classroom so technology is forbidden from the classroom there is no technology it's just the teacher teacher is the prime um, uh, focus in education 1.0 then came education 2.0 here uh, the communication and collaboration between teachers and students started to grow this was still exam based earlier it was not exam based it was it depends upon the teacher if the teacher says that you are fit you are fit if the teacher says you are not fit to go to the next class you are not fit to go that's it but later in education 2.0 exams were introduced the result is the examination that is you spend one year of your time studying in a particular class you write an exam then you go there go to the next class the exam is the end and the exam was actually focusing on memorization of knowledge whatever the teacher says in this one year you need to memorize it when the questions come you need to just uh, uh, omit the whole thing in the uh, uh, answer paper that's it so it was memorization that was important in this education 2.0 people were talking about student centered approach they were saying that look uh, we need to focus on the students not the teachers but it was not applied the schools were talking about hours of teaching but not the hours of learning we, we didn't care um, whether people learned or not we just cared whether we taught or not in fact when we go to the class and after after the whole uh, lecturing of uh, in inside the class we come out of the class and we think how beautiful we lectured in this class how effective was our lecture for whom effective for us for our perspective we didn't ever uh, think whether our student learned it how much they learned we didn't we didn't think about that question at all that was the uh, in the end of education 2.0 this was the scenario in education 3.0 it was actually a student centered approach the student was the focus teacher he is just a coordinator he is just a facilitator he just helps the student to learn and students they are researching the, uh, teachers don't teach the students students research on their own and come up with uh, their findings one key point here is flip classroom applies you flip the classroom you don't teach in the classroom you just provide materials you provide video materials you provide audio materials you provide presentations you provide projects students learn on their own and then they come to discussion that is the idea of flip classroom student is self learning with the help of technology and dialogue dialogue with whom dialogue with the teacher dialogue with the peers dialogue with other friends and when education 3.0 came up uh, the lesson plans 
were now called learning plans. You don't have lesson plan. You have learning plan. And the classical classroom does not exist. If you look at this classroom in the picture there, normally a classroom will have a big uh, blackboard and uh, many benches facing this particular blackboard. We don't have it here. We have a small board just for discussion sake. People don't face the board. They face the board as and when it is necessary. They face each other. They sit in round tables talking to each other, sharing information between each other. This is the way that Education 3.0 came up. Now, I'm talking about the world scenario. I'm not talking about India's scenario. And uh, we have not yet reached in this stage, even though some uh, <clears throat> uh, schools claim that they, have, they are uh, approaching this. I don't think we have uh, reached a far way from our uh, Education 1.0 2.0. Okay, we, I, we, I think we are still in 2.0. We didn't, we didn't even bother to reach 3.0. But the world has, uh, world is changing, and many countries have uh, already tried these approaches. And comes education 4.0. Here, this is the last one. Here, co-creation and innovation is the center. Co-creation means students. Uh, create things with the help of teachers. Teachers help them to create things, help them to materialize their ideas. Ideas, the students. It's not the teacher's idea. It's just the student's idea. Student's idea is being realized with the help of teachers. Learning is done at home or outside school. Nobody comes to school for learn, uh, learning. In schools, Students develop skills. They come to the school for developing skills, not for learning. Learning is done in the home. And personalized teaching and learning is happening. Means uh, if you have, say, 10 students in a class, each and every student will have different, different materials, depending upon their taste, personalized teaching, personalized learning. Learning plans in Education 4.0 is actually called creativity plans. It's not learning plan. Earlier, uh, we saw lesson plan was changed to learning plan. Learning plan was again changed to creativity plans. This has not yet come up. It will come up uh, very soon. Okay. And uh, uh, technology is free and easily accessible. Continuous evolution and innovation, need for continuous training and development of new knowledge and skills by all. It means that students need to update on their technical skills. Teachers also need to update on their, on their technical skills, but the tech, because the technology is changing. This is the scenario in Education 4.0. And the key shifts or the paradigm shifts that was related to uh, learning is that learning can take place anytime, anywhere. You don't need to come to the classroom to learn. You can have learning in your school, in your school bus, in the hotel, in the road, wherever you want. Learning can take place anytime, anywhere. Personalized learning, a key uh, a takeaway in, uh, or a key paradigm shift is personalized learning. That is because uh, Gardner in 1982, he proposed that there are multiple intelligences for each and every student. Some people, have spatial or visual intelligences. Some people have linguistic intelligence or verbal intelligence. Some people have interpersonal, intrapersonal, logical or mathematical intelligence, musical intelligence, bodily or 
kinesthetic intelligence or natural intelligence naturalistic intelligence now uh, gardner defined many set of intelligences multiple intelligences okay now uh, if you if you remember your olden days okay in in your olden days uh, in fact in my olden days also uh, since i i assume that uh, pro probably that we are all in the same age group or uh, a little bit plus or minus age groups so uh, earlier we used to learn from textbooks where words were there sentences were there we used to read it and we used to understand things then uh, so many people used to uh, focus on the textbooks because that is the way that they learn now some people they don't focus on textbooks they go to the class when teacher talks uh, that speech that audio signal that gives them better understanding so those people who have uh, a tendency to sit in the class and listen to something and then understand they have more of uh, um, a, a stronger audio intelligence some people they can understand only by seeing or they can understand more by seeing things they have visual intelligence now if you look at the uh, students from year to year you might have seen many students uh, throughout the years of your teaching experience earlier the students used to have uh, this textual in intelligence a lot later the students that you're facing today they are more prone to visual intelligence rather than textual intelligence they are happy if you if you share a video or they are happy if you have a multimedia presentation and things like that they are not uh, into words they are rather into pictures that is because they are trained in that way they uh, actually they uh, they are actually living in a digital world in fact in a in a study uh, uh, the difference between these two generations that is our generation and their generation they call it as the great digital divide and uh, we are actually called digital immigrants because uh, we have we we were born not in a digital age if you uh, remember or if you try to recollect uh, let me recollect my uh, experience i first saw the tv when i was in 8th standard till then i didn't see a tv 8th uh, standard was the first time when i saw a, a, a tv i was born in a different age when technology was not so much there in 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 the life of people the first computer i saw was when i joined for my btech in 1995 the first email that i created was probably in 1999 okay in my uh, after passing out from btech that is when i uh, created the first email account for me similarly you might have uh, similar experiences but what about the students today the students when uh, they are actually born in a digital age they are called digital natives they are the people of this land digital land we are digital immigrants we are not the people of this land we came here we are belonging to somewhere else so the students they are more into uh, technology if you for example uh, if i have some problem with my mobile phone my daughter fix it up for me or my son fix it up for uh, fixes it up for me they are small kids uh, uh, even if i am stuck with something uh, technical they are ready to help with uh, help and come up and uh, uh, give me the solution for that even though it is a silly a silly thing okay so they are more into uh, this digital world rather than uh, us so they are digital natives so uh, since they are digital natives the visual intelligence is more compared to textual intelligence because they have been tuned by watching tv watching computers and all if you look at tv uh, it is 
uh, the number of frames per second is 24. Okay, 24 frames per second. 24 images are passing through your eye in a particular second. But for us, when we when we were born, when we look at the outside world, it is our, uh, our perception is one by 17. That is 17 uh, frames per second. That is what we could perceive. Now the, these people have uh, been tuned to 24 uh, images per second. So their visual intelligence is uh, better to us, com uh, better compared to us. So that is why these skills, what skills they have is important. And that is why personalized learning and the choice in methodology comes up. Now, what experts say is that you need to give a choice in materials. For example, if you want to teach a particular topic, say for example, I want to teach on electromagnetic fields, I need to provide a material which is video based. I need to provide a material which is audio based. I need to provide a material which is text based. I need to provide a material which is project based. So students should have a choice between all these things. If you're more if you're having more visual intelligence, go watch the video. If you're more into reading text, go read this material. You don't need to watch the video. Finally, everything, the outcome of everything will be the same. Okay, so that is the choice in methodology. And uh, most of learning is project-based. They do and <clears throat> learn things, hands-on learning. And the data interpretation skills are also a paradigm shift. Earlier, we had to have uh, data or information from the teachers. Then the internet came up. We had data from the internet. Okay, so data interpretation is changing from uh, one generation to the other generation. Personalized assessments. Since you have already, uh, we have already talked about the choice in methodology, assessments are also based on your choices. You are more into uh, visual intelligence, you are more into video, don't give him uh, a textual question to answer. Give him some video assignments. That is what uh, this uh, paradigm shift from uh, education 1.0 to 4.0 means. Then the student designs the curriculum. You don't design a syllabus and you don't give it to them. The student decides a curriculum based on his own uh, perceptions are based on his own um, uh, intelligence levels. This is what I want to learn. This is what I want to learn. So that is my syllabus. You don't say that uh, this is your syllabus. You need to learn all these things now. And independent learning happens. Students learn on their own. You don't need to teach them. They learn by themselves. These are the paradigm shifts related to the learning scenario. So now we have seen two uh, things. One is the paradigm shifts in the industry. The second is the paradigm shifts in general education. Here again, I'm specif uh, sp specifically saying that it is general education, not technical education. Now let's focus on technical education and see what is different there. Technical education is a simple lagging copycat. When industry started to change, we were not bothered at all. When education started to change, we were not bothered at all. That will be shown by the brief history of technical education. We are still lagging behind these two, uh, uh, that is the industry as well as um, education, general education. If you look at technical education, in the early 19th century, Mechanics Institute, Working Women, uh, Men's College was started in Britain. Two different institutes. One focusing on uh, creating skilled labor. The other focusing on uh, the, the uh, incorporating a little bit of science into uh, whatever technical content they're teaching. Okay, this started in the early, early 19th century. 
at that time the idea of apprentice or ap apprenticeship was predominant that is uh, you are not a student when you are admitted into these uh, such kind of institutes you are not a student you are just an apprentice an apprentice is a person who is trying to learn things okay by doing it so uh, an apprenticeship for welding an apprenticeship for uh, uh, wiring and things like that okay so different types of apprenticeships are there and if you look at the uh, uh, in the uh, technical education was actually uh, tailored to the industry so when industrial revolution started the pioneers of inter industrial revolution they were not formally educated people but they were a product of craft apprenticeship apprenticeship means you just uh, join in as an apprentice you go to uh, a particular uh, place and you just um, uh, i mean uh, join there you study a particular skill then you travel throughout the world see what uh, what is different in that particular skill in different places and you, uh, when you return you become a trained or a craft apprenticeship then those kind of people they were the pioneers of the Re industrial revolution so uh, technology was not taught at that point and when the industry grew when they needed more and more skilled labor this long process of apprenticeship was not uh, feasible skilled labor was required so they created training institutes to create the still uh, skilled labor so the difference between apprenticeship and skilled labor is in apprenticeship you just travel around the world and you gain information on a particular uh, trade whereas in the training institute you are simply trained on a particular job that's it that particular job what industry needs that is the only training that is given to you so uh, this was the beginning of technical education and if you look at india the first technical institute that was established was in 1974 it was established to train surveyors sorry uh, not 1974 that's a mistake 1874 okay i'm sorry for that mistake 1874 1874 the madras survey school was started that was because east india company came into india when east india company came into india they wanted to survey the land that was their prime uh, motive to survey the land they wanted people local people who would uh, help in the survey so they started a school established a school and then trained surveyors for surveying the whole land that was the first technical institute that came up in india then in 1847 before 1847 what happened was the engineering uh, field was actually military dominant that is britishers came in to india with their engineering expertise and they were more into warfare and things like that so uh, military engineers were there in 1847 they uh, thought that find these uh, civilians that is the non military people they also need to have a little bit of engineering expertise to create buildings for them to create bridges to create roads to create railways and so they started civil engineering at thomason college now it is called iit roorkee that was the first engineering college that was started with uh, civil engineering as the first uh, i mean course of study then in 1860s <coughs> Uh, since india is a very vast country uh, a single college at a particular place in uttarakhand now in uttarakhand earlier in uttar pradesh was not enough 
So they created three colleges, one in the south, one in the west, and one in the east. And the uh, west college was called the Calcutta College of Civil Engineering. It was later renamed as Bengal Engineering College. In the east, uh, Overseer School of Pune was started, which was later called College of Engineering Pune. And in the south, College of Engineering Gindi, which was later, uh, which is right now Anna University was started. And till then, the focus was on civil, then mechanical, metallurgy. And then uh, it was when mechanical and metallurgy came up that uh, Indian school of mines and all, uh, I mean, schools of mining were started. In 1915, Indian Institute of Sci Science started the electrical technology program. That was the first degree level program that was started. Okay. And then uh, these are, these were the, I mean, civil mechanical, electrical and metallurgy were the prime uh, branches uh, in the earlier days. Now, if you look at the timelines, see, we started technical education maybe in the end, uh, in the beginning of the, uh, or the, in the end of, uh, beginning of the second industrial revolution or the end of the second industrial revolution. That is where uh, we started electrical technology and things like that. Okay. So uh, even though the world actually started using electricity, electrical engineering was not started as a course of study. It was started at a later point of time. So always we were lagging in our uh, uh, alignment with the, the industry. So we have seen three paths. One path is uh, the path of the industry. Second is the path of the general education. And the third is the path of technical education. And you can see that uh, these three paths were different. Industry was not looking at general education. General education was not looking at industry. Technical education was always lagging behind these two people. And if you see the evolution of or the inclusion of technology in all these scenarios, that is, if you look at the industry, uh, the penetration of education in industry has been increasing right from the beginning. Even though in the initial stages, skilled labors were uh, provided, and then uh, uh, education was used to train those skilled labors. Nowadays, if you look at industry, industry focuses on uh, diplomas, uh, degree levels, uh, level engineering, and things like that. So the penetration of education in industry has been increasing. Even though earlier, education was uh, different from industry. And if you look at technology, penetration of technology in education has also been increasing. Technology has been used in education uh, increasingly nowadays. Earlier, we just used to have a blackboard and a chalk to write on it and a duster. We shifted from there to uh, overhead projectors, OHPs, which trans with the transparent, uh, uh, I mean, sheets. Then we shifted from there to uh, PowerPoint presentations and things like that. Okay, so techno use of technology or penetration of technology in education is also increasing. And the only job of technical education as of now is to join hands with both uh, industry and education. That is, education has been using technology more and more. So they have a relationship. Education and industry has a relationship. Industry has been using education more and more increasingly. So again, that side also, they have a relationship. We are still left behind. now. Uh, uh, what we need to do is embrace them both. That's it. It's a simple job for us. 
end. Now we will see the changing nature of jobs and skills and a prelude to tomorrow's students. World Economic Forum in 2016, they came up with this idea of Industrial Revolution 4.0. And they predicted that in the end of Industrial Revolution 4.0, that is the dates that I have mentioned earlier, 2025, Okay, 2025 uh, to 2030, that is what uh, World Economic Forum uh, says. According to their data, fewer jobs in new industries than during other revolutions. Each and every industrial revolution created a new sets of jobs. new job skills that were defined. But as and when uh, the industrial revolution came from one to two to two to three to two, three to four, the number of jobs created in each and one, each and every industrial revolution was smaller and smaller. So it means that the new industrial revolution that is industrial revolution 4.0 it would create smaller number of jobs compared to all the other revolutions and now there are changes that the nature of jobs will also change for example earlier i talked about this uh, uh, spelling uh, thing so uh, when you just type in the first two uh, letters, you have the uh, words there. If you type the first two or three words, you have the whole sentence there. For example, in uh, the latest Gmail, if you s simply type, um, uh, suppose you want to reply to a particular email, email sent by Teresa teacher. Okay, I want to uh, simply reply to that email. So I'm saying uh, dear, okay? I'm just simply typing dear. If I type dear, automatically Teresa will come there. I don't need to uh, type Teresa there, okay? That is the, uh, uh, I mean, penetration of artificial intelligence into the e uh, Gmail scenarios. Similarly, the use of voice to text and things like that, okay? so. Uh, when you use voice to text, you just need to say the word. You don't need to spell the word. You just need to say it. You uh, open Google Assistant. In Google Assistant, simply say, uh, hello, how are you? It simply types there, hello, how are you? You don't need to know that H-E-L-L-O is the spelling of hello. Even if you have an impression that H-A-L-O is the spelling of hello, it's okay. The uh, device will, uh, I mean, correct it for you, okay? So the first set of teachers who will be affected with Industrial Revolution 4.0 is the language teachers. They used to teach spelling. They used to teach grammar. Now you don't need to learn grammar, right? Because it's already automatically taken care by the system. You just uh, simply type the uh, sentence there uh, in the word, then you will have this, uh, uh, what, a red marking there saying that it is wrong, grammar is wrong. You right click on it, it will suggest that this is the grammar that probably you want. Select it, that's it. So grammar, spelling, everything is uh, going to go. Like that, there are many jobs that are going to be affected. The jobs that are most prone to automation is one, telemarketing. If you earlier, when uh, we wanted to book for a, a cylinder, LPG cylinder, we used to call the um, 
uh, vendor there calls will always be engaged and then finally if you get your call you say that i want a cylinder uh, he books it there after 14 15 days the cylinder will be delivered see how it has changed now now just call a number it automatically goes to a computer the computer says that this is an ivrs automatic booking system and it automatically detects your consumer number it says this is your consumer number if you want to uh, book a refill press 1 you press 1 it says your bo uh, booking is done next day you receive the uh, lpg cylinder there so the telemarketing people people who are sitting in the call centers receiving your calls and responding to your calls they are no more they are most prone to automation tax earlier we used to hire people to calculate our taxes now you just have applications where you just enter your um, uh, you just enter your details and then uh, the application takes care of your tax calculations insurance you don't need to have insurance agents if you want to have a just uh, if you want to uh, say book an insurance or uh, apply for an insurance you just go to the site and register that's it give the payment done real estate everything is there in the internet you just don't need to go and search for uh, places talk to people and fix locations everything is there these are the jobs that are most prone to automation and there are some jobs which are least prone to automation like psychologists automation will not work there if you feel that your mind is out of order if you feel depressed you don't you don't want to call uh, uh, an automated system and say that this is my problem and they give you an automatic solution there no it won't work that way so psychologists they uh, are least prone to automation choreographers people who teach dance least prone to automation physicians and surgeons but still uh, physicians and surgeons there uh, the doctors they are actually uh, prone to automation because when uh, robots and things uh, come up inside it's just uh, monitoring what these robots are doing what these robotic arms are doing that is required okay and people uh, anthropology archaeology people who dig up the fossils they are least prone to automation marine engineering and naval architecture computer systems analysts are least prone to automation because they uh, have to oversee the whole automation process they are the ones who are creating this automation process so more and more of them are required as time progresses so if you look at the nature of jobs some jobs are going to be phased out from the world some jobs will still sustain so when we are going to teach our students we need to see what kind of a job will be there in the future and we need to train them accordingly world economic forum uh, they came up with a comparison of skills of 2025 versus skills of 2015 the left portion here it says the skills of 2025 in the right portion you have the skills of 2015 if you can see complex problem solving is a skill required in both 2025 and 15 so it means that you need to train your students for complex problem solving these are the top 10 uh, things so critical thinking or uh, we'll see the other one uh, 2015 complex problem solving was there 
coordinating with others, people management, critical thinking, negotiation, quality control, service orientation, judgment and decision making, active listening, creativity. These were the skills required in 2015. The people who have already passed out. Now, what about the current students? What are they required to learn? They are required to learn complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, working in a group, emotional intelligence. This is where our uh, teaching is lacking a lot because we don't teach emotional intelligence to students. We just focus on uh, intelligence quotient, not the emotional quotient, but it is a skill that is uh, definitely required for 2025. Uh, that is the prediction. Judgment and decision making, service orientation, negotiation, and cognitive flexibility. What does this mean? Cognitive flexibility means the flexibility in uh, studying. That is, if you are visually intelligent, I already said that I will only focus on videos. Now, if you give audios to him or if you give a text to him, he says, no, I want video. But that skill will not work. So that is where cognitive flexibility comes up. You should have a skill of uh, video learning. You should have a skill of audio learning. You should have a skill of textual learning also. So that is cognitive flexibility. Now, if you just compare these two skills, you can see that in 2015, we required active listening as a skill. The last but to, uh, one, active listening. That is not there in 2025. Means students need not know or need not listen. They don't need to have a skill to listen. And if you look at the, ex uh, the other one, quality control, it is not there in 2025. Quality control is not there. You don't need to control the quality of what you are uh, delivering. Okay because it is taken care by others, other things, that is the automation process and things like that. You don't need to have an extra skill there. The additional skills that is required here is emotional intelligence and cognitive flexibility. So these are the skill sets of 2025. So it means that whenever we are designing our curriculum, whenever we are teaching our students, we need to focus on these set of skills so that they will uh, flourish in the future. And what kind of students can you expect? In 21st century, the skills that is required is 16 skills are there for students. The first is literacy. They, they, these are called, there are three categories actually. Foundational literacies, competencies, and character qualities. For students, the first foundational literacy is, uh, it is literacy. Literacy, uh, I have already uh, talked about it earlier. Literacy means not uh, language skills, not reading skills, not writing skills, not mathematical skills. It is data interpretation skills. It is technology skills. It is human resource skills. That is the literacy. Numeracy. You need to know how to work with numbers, how to crunch numbers, basic multiplication, addition, division, and things like that. Basic 
for the others you can just use your calculators then the third one is scientific literacy scientific literacy means the literacy to differentiate between science and pseudoscience the literacy to uh, explore more into a particular phenomena the literacy of curiosity that is what uh, scientific literacy means ICT literacy that is technology literacy financial literacy how you deal with money then cultural and civic literacy what you need to do in a group how to deal with people or groups in the uh, uh, inside the college how to behave in groups what not to do and what to do these are the skills in literacy side that a student requires in 21 21st century now the competencies critical thinking and problem solving it's a competency creativity immense creativity is valued immensely communication and collaboration everything cannot be done by a single person working in groups is very important so that is where communication and collaboration comes up as competencies and regarding the qualities character qualities how students approach their changing environment because it is guaranteed that whatever environment they are living that environment is constantly changing you don't have a static environment there even if you look at your life whatever was there uh, earlier when you were studying is not there today it has been changed so constantly we are facing this change and in this changing environment how can you cope up so these skills are required one curiosity when a new fo- uh, new device comes up you need to have the curiosity as how this device will work and how to make it to work if a smartphone comes up to your hand and you say that no no oh, this is smartphone i don't know smartphone i will use only a uh, normal phone then obviously you don't have that uh, skill there students should have that curiosity skill otherwise they cannot survive in this world initiative they should have the skill to take the initiative and do things persistence stick on to a particular <clears throat> task adaptability fit on to the new environment when you are changing from one environment to another environment you are not comfortable with that environment you always want to live in the older environment it won't work in nowadays you need to have the adaptability there leadership quality because that is very important in uh, collaborative work social and cultural awareness the way in which society functions the way in which culture is defined different people having different cultures how to cope up with the differences in cultures all these students should know overall students should be having the capacity for lifelong learning that is the key word lifelong learning so if your student is ready for lifelong learning experience then he is fit for the next generation next generation we call them as generation z so fit for generation z now i talked about the student skill set and the students when you want to incorporate these skill sets in the students one 
key difference or key point that you need to understand is the attention span. In 2000, in the year 2000, people measured the attention span of human beings. It was 12 seconds, continuous attention span. After 12 seconds, you need to change your uh, focus. Now, remember, this is just the attention span continuously uh, focusing on nothing else but a particular point. We are not talking about the continuous uh, sitting in the class. That is also actually changing. Year to year, the continuous sitting in the class is also changing. Now it is just, I guess, 20 minutes or so. So uh, we have actually designed our classes for uh, what, one or two hours. Two hours of continuous listening a class, impossible. You can't do that. Maximum time you can sit uh, focusing on a class is 20 minutes. Then you need to have a break. But unfortunately, we have not yet uh, tuned ourselves to this. Even this class happens two hours. Two hours is too much. Okay. Now, uh, the, in 2000, so when we measured the uh, human attention span, continuous attention span, it was 12 seconds. And at the same time, in 2013, okay, this 12 seconds came down to eight seconds. Now it is probably a little bit lesser. In 2000, we had an attention span of 12 seconds. But in 2013, that attention span changed from 12 seconds to eight seconds. And curiously, goldfish, it has an attention span of nine seconds, better than us. So we are changing. Our students are changing. The people who come in front of you to sit and uh, get knowledge, they are changing continuously. But unfortunately, we are not ready to cope up with that change. Now, I talked about the co competencies of students. Now, what about the competencies of teachers? Do teachers need to have certain skill sets for tomorrow? Definitely, yes. The first competency is educational competence. Whatever you're teaching, be passionate about it. Experts say that you, uh, if, you are, if you are going to become a teacher, you need two loves. First love, love for the subject. Second love, love for the children. These two loves are the loves that are uh, definitely required for a teacher. So the first one is educational competence. You should have the love for the subject and you should be competent in that subject. The second one, competence for technological commercialization means when technology is changing, you need to cope up with the changing technology. PowerPoint has come. Wherever PowerPoint can be used or um, should be used, it should be used. Wherever chalk teaching should be used, it should be used there. When a new technology comes up, if we are ready to accept the technology and find a use for technology, don't uh, try to use a technology for the sake of using technology, no. If you feel that it is essential, if it, um, I mean, uh, leads to a little bit of um, uh, imp improvisation in the understanding of students, then it is fine. You need to do that. Then competence in globalization. Understand that the world is changing. Globalization has already come up. 
what is happening in one part of the world is soon going to come to your place there is no uh, big lag there we have shrinked in terms of distances we have shrinked in terms of time that competence should be there for us competence in future strategies because if you see the teachers role is going to change when all these industrial revolutions have come up and it comes to our society uh, teachers role is going to change now the question is um, what strategy we have to employ to make our students competent for that change so we need to devise strategies for each and every student the strategy would be different so competence in future strategies is a prime uh, competence that a teacher should have and counselor competence understand the mindset of the uh, students and try to help them cope up with the changing scenarios these are the competencies required for a teacher tomorrow's teacher so remember in these competencies okay these competencies were actually coined by uh, world economic forum so uh, you can see that teaching is not a competency in among this list you don't need to know how to teach fine it's okay if you don't know to teach no problem then also you can become a teacher but provided you should have the other uh, i mean love for the subject and devising methods to uh, create content that is enough now if you look at the teacher teacher has evolved through different stages when we were studying actually the teacher was like an actor he performs on stage he uh, delivers the content on stage and who is the best teacher with that we ever uh, saw the teacher who teaches it dramatically if you look at your uh, um i mean favorite teachers the favorite teacher for you is the teacher who has dramatically uh, uh, presented the idea what whatever he is teaching maybe in terms of the drama itself or in terms of the theater itself or maybe in the delivery of the subject the way in which he teaches the way in which he delivers the content that impressed you right i i hope uh, everyone has this uh, idea so teacher was an actor earlier and now when we started teaching we are more of managers rather than actors because uh, if you look at the teaching profession as such the workload in terms of uh, teaching that we have that is comparatively smaller than the clerical job that we are doing right compiling the attendances uh, taking assignments checking valuing scripts uh, doing this proposal proposal financial proposals academic proposals attending meetings things like that so we are actually managers rather than actors nowadays and we are supposed according to the fourth industrial revolution and things like that we are supposed to change from the managerial role to the role of a guide you just need to guide your students that's it show them new things it's not just uh, acting of that uh, a new thing in in front of in the class is just showing that's it see this is how it works then uh, students explore 
how it works. That's the way things happen. Things should happen. So the change from the, or the paradigm shift from the managerial role to the guide role, that is the evolution of teacher. Now, when COVID came up in last uh, March, right? It came in March. It's in fact about uh, <clears throat> eight, eight months, uh, nine months now, I guess, eight months, yeah. Our life suddenly changed. It was just a drastic change, you know. Uh, till uh, evening, eight o'clock, we were happy. We were preparing for the next day's class and things like that. Suddenly, the announcement came that lockdown. We went into a sudden lockdown and it continued for about nine months. But still, we uh, what did we do there? We actually utilized this opportunity to uh, start online teaching, online meetings, online presentations, and things like that. We start moving to technology more and more, relying on technology more and more. That means we are trying to accelerate the change of industrial revolutions in our educational scenario also. It is actually an opportunity, right? Suppose just simply assume that COVID did not come. If COVID did not come, then do you think that we would uh, switch on to online teaching or learning? Do you think that we would prepare our video lectures? Do you think that we would prepare slides for each and every class that we are going to take? No. As usual, we would have gone for our, uh, uh, what um, the uh, blackboard kind of teaching, right? We were forced to make slides. We were forced to use technology. So uh, COVID actually accelerated the use of technology in education. That is an opportunity. And now let's go to uh, the classrooms of today and tomorrow. And how, when, when the COVID uh, ends, people come to your uh, institutes, you will have to re-engineer the whole thing. Do you think still people will enjoy your uh, Blackboard teaching? Maybe some, maybe some not. You will have to use many, many uh, ideas. You will have to uh, have many support materials. So the classroom environment is going to change. How to re-engineer this? The first and foremost re-engineering should happen to the classroom. Right now, we have teacher-centered classroom. If you enter into a classroom, you have a big blackboard. You have benches facing the blackboard. You are the actor in the stage. As a teacher, you are the center of the knowledge. Students look at you. You deliver the lectures. They download the information from the teacher and reproduce in a test, which is designed to measure how much content they could remember. That is the teacher-centered classroom. We need to shift to the student-centered classroom. Instead of us, uh, each after each and every class, instead of asking the question, how beautifully I've taught today, you need to ask how beautifully they've learned today. Did they learn anything? That is the question you need to ask. We need to go to a student-centered classroom. So teacher is not a sage on the stage, but a guide on the side. Your role is going to change from an actor to a guide. Now, to make this change happen, let's go back and see how we perceive the information long, long ago. When man was a nomad, uh, hunting for animals for food, 
how uh, was his life at that part time probably he would be hunting a mammoth or something like that a buffalo or whatever when they are hunting some important things that we can infer from them is they should have worked in groups you cannot hunt alone you have to work in groups to hunt this beast and the experiences in hunting that differs and in the night probably they would tell stories of how the hunt went on the same way to tackle a student we can use some principles to design the classroom of tomorrow first is what we said earlier collaboration for hunting the mammoth you need to work in groups so collaborative learning now when we talk about collaborative learning one thing is who is the topper in the class is not a question again because there are no toppers everyone is a topper because everyone collaborated to learn this particular topic so in tomorrow's classroom you don't have you won't have uh, toppers you won't have anything like that there is no com uh, competition between them it's just a collaborative effort to learn things communication between them will be a key point in tomorrow's classroom creativity would be a key aspect critical thinking would be a key aspect and out of all this most importantly choice would be a key aspect choosing on what to learn choosing on how to learn what materials to use all these would be aspects of tomorrow's classroom so it would be a student centered classroom now how can you identify a student centered classroom student centered classroom the first point is if you if you go to a classroom and look at the classroom the way in which uh, the classroom functions the first uh, indication that it is a student centered classroom is that there is active learning now on learning there have been many theories on learning okay uh, it was plato who first said that we are all born we are born knowing all what uh, all we, we would ever know learning is just reminding us of what our souls knew from birth this is the first theory on learning suggested by plato he said that we know everything while we are born itself we know everything what when we are learning what actually we do is uh uncovering whatever we know which is hidden inside us that is what plato said then theories of learning came up john locke he came up with a theory called tabula rasa which is called the blank slate theory and he said that we were born knowing nothing we did not know anything when we were born we possess mental powers which allows us to learn new things this is an entirely opposite view of plato so this is a theory that came up uh, after plato late in uh, 80s sorry uh, 18 18 uh, 19th century then in 1920s rank packet he came up with an idea of constructivism he said that learner builds on what they know to construct understanding learner knows something in inside him and he starts building upon it to construct whatever understanding is required and then latest theory is vygotsky's social constructivism theory he said that constructivism is there but 
the construction of knowledge is always through social interactions so a student centered classroom where active learning happens is most probably a place where social constructivism is at work so that is the idea of active learning so if you look go to a classroom you see that active learning is happening there then it means that it is a student centered classroom the second indication collaborative learning students learn complex ideas more, uh, more effectively when explained by peers that is a research <coughs> finding that is as a teacher if you try to explain something the student is not able to understand but if his friend explains the same thing to him he easily underst understands so when it is explained by peers if an idea is easily uh, understandable then it means that collaborative learning will be more effective than classroom teaching so signs of sign number 2 for a student centered classroom collaborative learning sign number 3 is differentiation differentiation in the content there are different contents for the same thing video content audio content any contents different processes how teachers sequence the learning and the ways in which students learn the process is different some students learn in one way some students learn in a different way it is fine we don't need to uh, enforce a particular process and finally the product how we measure their learning some people have exams some other people have uh, 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 assignments some other people have projects and things like that okay and the environment where students learn maybe they are learning in the classroom maybe they are learning in the um, a home whatever okay so these are the uh, differentiation is a as a um, indicator of student centered classroom and social emotional learning is a sign social awareness responsible decision making self awareness self management relationship skills and all that earlier when um, uh, darwin uh, came up with the theory of evolution he said that uh, man was created from the monkey then there was a big debate which is called the great debate i think the year was 1862 or something where thomas henry huxley who was uh, who was known as the uh, who was known as darwin's bulldog okay he was asked a question will man uh, you are saying that uh, look sir you are saying that um, uh, man came from the monkey so will man evolve after this into some other animal the answer he gave was man will evolve to a socially conscious animal that is what the answer he gave socially conscious animal aware of what society is aware that he has no existence without society aware that he is responsible for others existence and others are responsible for his own existence that is what man will evolve this was the idea so the sign of a student centered classroom is social uh, consciousness social emotional learning and the learner has a choice as i already said in terms of books in terms of materials everything and he has a voice in terms of 
uh, uh, giving the opportunity to use their unique voices to show what uh, they know, what they learned. They have a voice there to say that this is what I want. This is the material that I'm comfortable with. I'm not comfortable with text. I'm comfortable with audio. I'm not comfortable with audio. I'm comfortable with video. Fine. They have a voice there. And education works when people have opportunities to find and develop unaccessed or unknown voices and skills. Opportunities for flexibility and choice assist learners in finding passion, voice, and revelation through their work. This is what Joshua Block said. And the sixth and last sign is technology integration. If you go to the classroom, you can see a lot of technology there, not just PowerPoints, not just, uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, projectors, not just a TV or something like that. Many things, many devices, many applications, everything. It will be technology heavy, a classroom. And not only in the classroom, classroom is the first place where re-engineering is to happen. Re-engineering should happen in the curriculum also. Curriculum should be drastically changed in the ways in which we evaluate. Evaluation should also be changed. I, I, I hope there were sessions uh, yesterday and day before yesterday and all on evaluation and things like that. The learning objectives, it should incorporate technology into it and change. So these are the changes that we are expecting in a classroom in industrial revolution 4.0. And the question is, the change is approaching, but are you ready? As the uh, famous saying goes, when change rolls like a road roller, you are either part of the wheel or part of the road. If you are not ready to change, then you're part of the road, that's it. If you're ready to change, then probably you can go further. There are many teachers in our uh, uh, schools and colleges and all, in fact, in our institutes, where they are not ready to adapt to this new changes, this new technology and all. I'll just go through a simple experiment, which was uh, done by Sugata Mitra. Sugata Mitra, he came up with a beautiful experiment called hole in the wall experiment. What he did was he went to uh, the outskirts of Delhi and he created a room, he built a room there, single room, okay? And uh, the villagers there uh, were not aware of the computer. Nobody knew what a computer was. He just created a room. He put a computer inside it. He switched on the computer and he closed the room. Now, if you look at this picture in the left, the room had two openings. Okay, one opening was to look at the screen and the other opening, uh, there were two holes. One hole, if you look at the, uh, if you peep into that hole, you can see the computer screen. In the second hole, if you put your hand inside that hole, you'll get, get hold of a mouse. He just switched on the computer, he went away. After four months, he came back. When he came back, the scene that he saw was a fifth standard student was teaching his uh, sister, smaller sister, how to browse the internet. The idea was there was no intervention, nobody came there to teach them computers. Through their curiosity, they just peeped in, uh, took hold of things, and slowly, slowly, they learned. So the result of this experiment was that 
um, you don't need to teach technology. Technology cannot be turned, uh, taught, but it can only be learned. That is the key understanding of this uh, experiment. And he conducted a second experiment. Second experiment, he went to Hyderabad. And um, in the outskirts of Hyderabad, the, in the slum area of Hyderabad, there were some women help groups. And in this group, uh, there were uh, graduates, uh, there were people who knew a little bit of computers and all. So he went and gave them some computers. And uh, in that computer, he installed uh, a speech to text conversion software. And he asked them to speak in English. And they spoke in English with a Telugu accent. And when they spoke with a Telugu accent, the text that came up there was rubbish. Because he had tuned this uh, converter, that is the converter that converts speech into text uh, into British English. So if you speak in British accent only, it will recognize that particular text. They spoke in Telugu accent and uh, throw uh, rubbish, trash in their screens. They asked him what to do. He said, I don't know, you do whatever you want. And he went away. After six months, when he came back to that same location, what he saw was all these ladies who were involved in this uh, uh, self-help group were speaking British accent English. Again, nobody came and taught them British English. They learned on their own. The same uh, theory, that is technology cannot be taught, but can be learned, is valid there. Even if you look at your lives, see, when uh, this ATM came in, okay, there were no courses on how to use this ATM card. Nobody, uh, uh, I mean, hosted a program uh, saying a short term course or something like that, saying uh, with ways to use your ATM card. Nothing like that was there. ATM card came, you started using it, that's it. Maybe you first went and stuck it into a different hole or whatever, but finally uh, you were used to it, right? So technology is like that. It just comes. Nobody taught you how to use the smartphone. You brought a smartphone, you started using it, that's it. You learned on the go, right? Similarly, when technology changes drastically, nobody can teach you all these new technologies. The only thing is you can learn these technologies. And if you don't learn it, then you will be left out from the uh, arena of education itself. So let me conclude. I've talked about industrial revolution 4.0, it is already taking pace. COVID has actually accelerated the pace of Industrial Revolution 4.0. Education is also falling in line. Technical education is was still lagging behind. So that is the need for re-engineering technical education or re-engineering engineering education. The first re-engineering should happen in the classroom that we have seen not only in the classroom, the curriculum, in uh, the evaluation and everything, we need to re-engineer it. And the, the stock was actually meant for showing the necessity of re-engineering, not how to re-engineer. I didn't say anything about that. That we will have to devise our own way, ways in which how to re-engineer the whole thing. But Re-engineering is essential, required. So with this, uh, I just uh, stop here. And uh, once again, I thank you for your patient listening. I thank you for giving this opportunity. Uh, I'm indeed honored to be a part of this uh, audience. I have not seen you though, but still um, thanks a lot from uh, especially thanks to Teresa teacher. She was the person who contacted me and uh, 
for uh, this talk. So thanks a lot. Now I can answer any questions uh, if you have. Oh. Sir, shall I read out the question? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Will industrial revolution of any stage affect nature or sustainability? We are actually moving towards a sustainable um, world. So industrial revolution is actually, um, it'll, it'll uh, affect sustainability in a positive way. Because when the fossil fuels, use of fossil fuels and things like that will reduce by uh, new technologies that is coming up, like smart technologies, smart grids and all, they are all part of industrial revolution 4.0. Uh, definitely sustainability will uh, uh, have a positive influence. That is what I feel. I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Elaborate on the flipped classroom, how far it is effective in ah, India? Flipped classroom, if you want to know more about flipped classroom, there is uh, there are some materials, uh, probably uh, Cynthia Force, as a professor at uh, in a university of that I uh, don't remember uh, correctly, uh, Cynthia Force. She was a pioneer in this area. What she did was uh, she uh, instead of teaching students, what they did was they uh, recorded videos of the materials, provided different kinds of materials to students, they can choose whatever kind of material they want. And uh, they can see the videos and uh, things like that from their rooms, uh, from their homes, they don't need to come to the classroom. The reason why they want to come to the classroom is just to have a discussion to clarify on the doubts, just to, um, uh, I mean, have an interaction with the teacher and the other, uh, other friends and things like that. It is mostly focused on assignments rather than uh, lecture delivery. Okay, a lot of material is available in the internet on flipped classrooms, especially these uh, examples from Cynthia Forge will help you a lot. During COVID-19, do you mm. think that flipped classroom can be a solution to complete the syllabus? <laughs> Are we at the Government College of Engineering, Kannur, we have already started our laboratory demonstrations through this flipped classroom. We take uh, videos of uh, the theory portion. We incorporate it with the uh, uh, demonstration, live demonstration from the laboratory. And then uh, we add, uh, um, I mean, some music and things like that and make the video beautiful and uh, the uh, record work okay is also added to this and we give it to students beforehand means if suppose today is the lab work we will give it in the morning and uh, ask them to upload the answers in the night okay that is how our laboratory is going on so that is a kind of a flipped classroom uh, but we need to add more of a, an assignment kind of thing also to make this uh, flipped up uh, classroom uh, completely flipped classroom. Okay, so it is a semi flipped classroom that we have tried so far. Uh, so uh, this of, of course can be used to uh, uh, finish the, uh, or maybe uncover the syllabus at least. Uh, I think it would be effective because uh, in these flipped classrooms, students enjoy it actually. They have given a good feedback on how uh, things go there. When we use different kinds of materials, for example, I am also teaching a subject called sustainability engineering. So in that I use a lot of videos uh, from YouTube and things like that. Uh, students actually enjoy those videos. So I guess it works. So probably if we tailor our uh, material in such a way that uh, we focus on completing the syllabus, it can be easily done. That is what I feel.
Thank you, sir. Okay. First of all, let me thank Professor Sukesh for taking all of us a journey through the phases of industrial revolution and the paradigm shift in general education. Sir emphasized on the relevance of data literacy, technology literacy, human resource literacy, and the skills needed by the students of today. Above all, the impact of the session would be reminding us teachers to have love for the subject and love for the students. This session leaves us with a note, student-centered classroom, the need of the day, when and where we need to adapt to the technological changes that are going around us. Thank you, sir, once again for your wonderful session on re-engineering, engineering education. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. And thank you, dear participants. Participants can fill in the feedback and the attendance form shared in the chat box. The next session will begin at 2 p.m.